Hey. Hey there. Um, so this is um, lecture two, which is this you know a series of talks on Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, and you know more broadly Smith's Smith's ideas, right, about economics and social philosophy. This talk um, is is this is part two of. I think four parts at this point on Smith um, and this is particularly on Smith's uh, theory of value and uh, we're going to talk uh, about about that but also kind of try as much as possible to bring the discussion into present economic thought too and we'll also be uh, thinking about some of the implied moral philosophy of Smith's Wealth of Nations in this uh, in this talk. And I think uh, probably that that's going to be a focus in maybe the fourth part uh, in, in, in total. Anyway, I'm trying to keep these relatively short, so, um, you know, we'll just hop, hop right into it. Um, so, you know, value is like, like with the, most of the ideas we'll investigate throughout this term, you know, value is one of those things that, uh, it, you know, you're actually gonna have more questions about after this lecture than, than you had before, because it's just something that we tend to take for granted. You know, why why is this thing valuable or, or that other thing less valuable? You know, why we go to the store, why are some things expensive and other things cheap? You know. And, and we probably have some ideas in our head about why that is. You know, maybe we think, oh, you know, that thing took a long time to make, and so it's, you know, it's more expensive, or you know, that type has that that thing has very poor quality materials, and so that's why it's very inexpensive. Um, but as we'll see, though, both of those notions are really um, inconsistent with 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 modern economic theory, uh, and and they're actually more consistent with these old ideas of economics, um, Smith as well as some of the other authors that we'll read. And so even though the topic may seem pedestrian, it's certainly worthwhile to go back and think about it in some depth, if only to uh, remove our own biases uh, in, in thinking about these ideas so that we might you know, think about them a little more clearly as economists. Okay, so, you know, on this first slide here, we've got a couple questions. This is uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, the uh, Catholic uh, theologian and, and uh, philosophical writer. Had a lot of interesting things to say about, well, in intelligent things to say about value and, and valuation processes. But you know, the things have value because they're scarce. You know, I, I'm, I'm neither a fan or, nor a detractor of Bitcoin and other virtual currencies. Uh, it's a curiosity to me. But whenever I ask people, well, why does Bitcoin have value? They say, because it's scarce. <laughs> well, lots of things are scarce. Um, see that picture on the wall there, right there? It's, like, it's a bird, right? It's a, it's a sort of needlepoint type of thing. It's um, extremely scarce. Uh, somebody made it, right? <laughs> and uh, and there's only one of them. Um, but, you know, I was able to get it at a garage sale for 50 cents. <laughs> it's extremely scarce, but it's not very valuable. Scarcity doesn't convey value. Uh, if you, you know, you might uh, have some a drawing you made when you were four. There's only one of them. It's unique not valuable. The things have value because we need them. Again, you know, we need we need clean air, but boy, try getting people to, you know, pay to clean it up. Um, it's a difficult prospect. And for the most part, it's it's free, right? Clean air. Um, so that that can't be the answer to two. Uh, and indeed, most of the things we, we would think of, right, actually end up not not being the answer so of course we need clean drinkable water right but generally the price is zero uh, here to give an example of artwork 
And there's a bunch of rocks here in the picture. What are those rocks? It's gold ore. I mean, there's other minerals in there, right? I, I can see quartz and things like that, but it's gold ore. Okay, so, uh, you know, that that's what gold looks like when you find it in the ground. <laughs> so it's, gold is valuable. Well, why, right? right? Why is gold valuable? Um, we'll talk about that a little more later on. Now, you know, this, this idea of the water diamond paradox is an old, it predates Smith, right? It goes back at least to Locke that I'm aware of. But Smith talks about this idea of the water diamond paradox. It's so like the paradox is, you know, we need water, um, but, it, but it doesn't have positive price, at least certainly in Smith's time. And diamonds are very valuable but but we we don't need them at all they're just purely a luxury now i know some of you may say why well, you need diamonds in a phonograph needle and things like that yeah 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 there's there's certainly uses for diamonds beyond just aesthetics um, but the point still stands and what smith did and uh really all the economists that we're going to read to rectify this paradox or to get around this paradox is they use different terminology for the ideas of value and price. Um, we'll talk about each of those in turn. In turn. This time we're per predominantly going to talk about the idea of price in Smith. Um, but we will return uh, in a later uh, later set of talks about, about Smith's concept of value, which leads into sort of the, some of the moral philosophy issues that I was talking about a little while ago. Here, of course, I think you all know I, I like scooters, right? So, so I, I put this, this Vespa here. That's a 1946 Vespa. Um, I put them because, you know, people often remark to me that, you know, scooters, you know, <laughs> that, that scooter there sold at auction a couple of years ago now. Uh, it had just been restored and uh, sold for sold for just over a hundred thousand dollars. So I paused there on purpose, right? <laughs> uh, what's valuable to you or somebody else isn't isn't necessarily valuable to somebody else. And things that you think aren't valuable are often very valuable to somebody else. Okay. Um, I know, you know, I, I was grew up here in Wisconsin and so dad restored old cars and things like that. I was a kid, it was always around junky metal stuff <laughs> more than anything else. <laughs> and uh, you know, so I'll still remark on old cars and things like this as we'll, we'll drive around town, we'll see an old car. You know, my wife will invariably say that it's junk. <laughs> the car's junk. <laughs> it's a you know, restored old car, right? So you know what? What some people say, see as valuable isn't isn't at all what other people see as valuable. And um, our conceptions of value uh, can really lead us to bias our analysis and our thinking. Right? We we have to sort of step back a little bit from everything we think we know about value before we can start being objective about it. Okay, so. Separating these ideas of value and price, as I mentioned before, Adam Smith is going to talk about value and use, or use value, and then he's going to talk also about value and exchange, or exchange value. And that separation is going to be taken up by, by really all the other classical economists through, through Karl Marx. So David Ricardo, Thomas Malthus, John Stuart Mill, all these guys are going to talk about value in use and value in exchange. Value in use is complicated, and um, it's going to take a little more thinking to get back to that. So we're going to we're going to focus more here on the idea of value in exchange. And what what Smith means by value in exchange is is kind of what we would think of as price or or maybe value too, right? Because it well we'll get to that a little bit later, but. <clears throat> that's the that's the the amount that a given commodity can command in the market. So, the exchange value is is market price. Okay. All right. 
So, you know, we would call price, or, you know, the amount of the good or service can command in the marketplace. This is exchange value to Smith. That is the value of the good or service has an exchange. Here's the picture, you know, some, I'm, this is kind of the theme with this slideshow, right, is, is value and price, right? So those are pictures of Beanie Babies, <laughs> which uh, back in the mid, early to mid 90s were a big thing, right? People were paying hundreds, in some cases, thousands of dollars for those small stuffed animals. Not not all of them, mind you, just 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 one, right? So the uh, they became quite a collector craze for a short period of time. Anyway, I'm gonna have lots of slides with that kind of stuff, right? Here's another one, Furbies, right? I think those came back actually recently. So. <clears throat> Smith's specific answer for this problem, right? So if you, you you should really go back and read the original sources in general, but uh, the original this is uh, Wealth of Nations, Book One, Chapters Five through Seven. So, in the first lecture, we really covered the material in book in chapters, excuse me, chapters one through four. Uh, in this, um, we're really talking five through seven. And the answer there it gives there, so, so what determines price, right? Okay, so what determines exchange value? Um, you know, Smith says it depends, right? And so what does it depend upon? Well, let's take a look. So Smith refer, makes distinguishes between what he refers to as what we might think of as the short run and the long run. Um, Smith's terminology is going to be different. He's going to refer to day-to-day -day versus the natural, I'll say that again, natural price of a good or service. Okay. Um, and in terms of the day-to-day -day price of a good or service, so we think, you know, you would go to the market or we, we go to the store, you know, what determines the price of the good on that day? Okay, well, Smith says, it, you know, doesn't say supply and demand, right, so directly, but he says, you know, a variety of characteristics can impact the price on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, some examples here, fads, weather, changing transportation costs, information failures, you know, you name it, right? Could be just a, the train broke down and didn't get enough uh, oranges to the market that day, and as a consequence, the price of oranges went up. Okay, so it's, it's nothing to do with oranges in that case, or preferences for oranges is just an upstream supply-based technological failure. Okay. And as a consequence, Smith says, there's really not much we can say about it scientifically. It's sort of up to the peculiarities of the market. Okay. But uh, as to the natural price of a commodity, what Smith calls the natural price, he, he has a fair bit to say. And in thinking of this idea of natural price, what Smith is getting at is the idea that prices will gravitate towards a certain amount over a period of time. So some days the price might be above the so-called natural price, and some days it might be below or below the natural price. So you think it's sort of a natural price. Mean is too strong of a term, but, but I think you get the idea. Um, the natural price is a price to which a good or commodity gravitates towards over a period of time. Okay, and this is what he's going to base his uh, theory of value on. And his argument that the natural price will be. Oh, I, I guess I have one more slide here. This <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so you can pause here and you can you can read this slide and then like answer that question. You know, so, is, what is the foundation on which prices, modern prices, lie? I don't know. Smith has an answer, right? Okay, enough pause. Let's go on to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, so you know Smith thought that the natural price would be a reflection of the cost of producing a good. Okay, so that's kind of like where we started, right? Oh, well, that thing's expensive because, boy, you know, you know, you make those things, it costs a lot, it costs a lot, right? <laughs> make that thing, it costs very little. And so that's kind of where Smith starts. It's a cost of production uh, theory of exchange value. Okay? But, of course, cost of production just gets us back to another set of prices, right? So you say, like, oh, well, you know, that thing, that, that Maserati or whatever, that could cost a lot to make that. Okay. Well, that just means that 
the supply costs to Maserati were high, which is just another set of prices, right? <laughs> so it's not an answer to the question. Right? You can't just say it costs more to make it, right? Um, because you still haven't, you, you've explained price by explaining nothing. <laughs> Okay, so so let's 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 take a step back, right? I'm not saying Smith, right, ends there, right? He's he's not he's way smarter than that. <laughs> okay. Pe people will explain things that way, but it's obviously not correct, right? So Smith um, makes a simplifying assumption and he attributes all uh, production value to labor. Uh, so he's in Smith's case, this is a simplification, right? As we're going to see in the next generation of economists through Karl Marx, so really everybody else we're going to study is that is that they sort of locked into this, right? It's not, not really a simplifying assumption. They're going to utilize what we're going to refer to as a labor theory of value. Okay, so all value is derivable from labor. Smith isn't really quite doing that, and in some ways he's he's ahead of actually his, his the next generation and the generation after that of economists. But he's also a lot less specific than they're going to be. So, you know, they'll give a little, take a little. But, so Smith is able to, to push cost, right? So this thing costs a lot to make. Why does it cost a lot to make? Because the labor costs a lot. Okay, right, okay. So now we're into the sort of labor market. Got the whole kids out here in front of my window <laughs> laughing at me. <laughs> Get that kooky stuck in there making economics videos. All right. So, again, you know, the exchange value is a, the natural exchange value of a commodity is a function of its cost of production, and cost of production are a direct function of the wage rate paid. Okay. So, <clears throat> Smith recognizes that, that labor isn't totally homogeneous. That is to say, all labor isn't exactly the same, right? You have some labor that's very highly skilled, some labor that's semi-skilled, and, and some labor that's not skilled at all. And so he recognizes this and and uh, makes an accommodation and says, well, you know, skilled labor will get paid more and hence will cost more in, in the marketplace and will produce therefore higher cost goods and service or higher priced goods and services, excuse me, because the skilled labor takes labor to make it. So if we, th so what is this, right? Well, if we think about what we're doing right now, I mean, at least we hope, right? You're gaining skills in the educational process. If you haven't, you know, we're really not doing our job. But this takes time, right? It takes time, it takes effort, it takes labor, right? <laughs> you're laboring, I'm laboring right now to, I'm laboring to teach you stuff and, and you're la learn, laboring to learn stuff, right? And because of that additional time, uh, skilled labor has to command more in the market, according to Smith, which results in, in a higher price, which results higher labor price, right, which results in a higher production cost for whatever we produce, which then commands a higher price in the marketplace. Natural price. Doesn't mean the day-to-day -day price is that, but that's sort of where it's going to oscillate around. So I think you can see that this is a very um, common sense sort of argument, right? It's, it's appealing. It's appealing argument. It's uh, reasonably well thought through. Uh, and if you were to present it to most folks, they would, they would likely accept it. Okay. Um, these are Pokemon cards, right? So <laughs> other crazy things that uh, have all kinds of crazy prices sometimes. Okay, <clears throat> so what do we get there then, right? Okay, so we, we're walking back just like we did in the last lecture. Okay, why do things have price, right? Why, what determines the price of a thing? Well, according to Smith, a lot of things, right? But the natural price of a thing is determined by the cost of its inputs. And if we assume that all inputs are our labor inputs, then differentials in the cost of production are due to different, different labor costs. 
Why are there different labor costs? Because there's different time and effort embedded within different units of labor due to skill and training sets, skill sets and training, excuse me. So at the end of the day, right at the pinky end, what do we have? We have a theory of relative wages that hinge upon time and effort. And we have a theory of relative natural prices that hinge upon relative time and effort. Okay, so it's, it's, it, it is a cost of production uh, theory of prices. Okay. It's, not, it's not a crude labor theory of value because we, we acknowledge that there are different types of labor. And it is also not a crude labor theory of value because we acknowledge that there are um, variations in price that uh, that are unexplainable, right? Can be for a variety of, of, of forces can move those prices out of their natural range for periods of time. Okay, so but that's all relative, right? Like why is that good expensive and this good cheap, right? Okay, so we, so we've got that, right? We've got a theory of, of sort of relative prices. I should go back to and clarify something that I said a moment ago. Um, I talked about uh, labor theory of value. S sometimes people refer to Smith's theory as a labor commanded theory uh, rather than labor embodied. Um, I'll come back to that in the next series of lectures at, in a little more depth. It really requires a little bit more of a think through than, than we can afford to give it right now. Okay. Suffice it to say that, that Smith's theory of relative prices is still predominantly cost of production and um, based upon some, some natural elements in this just sort of difficulty style stuff. It's hard to get to market, so therefore it's more expensive sort of stuff, right? And that's not, by the way, if you're thinking like, oh yeah, of course, right, of course that's what, no, that's not how we think in modern economics, okay? Uh, you know, your, your, your microeconomic price, partial equilibrium microeconomic price where S equals D, this, that's not how that happens, okay? That's not, not what's going on there at all. Okay, so Smith is, um, is a different way of thinking. It's very straightforward, it's very matter of fact, it's very practical, like I said, it sells pretty easily probably to folks if you were to tell people that. Um, but that's not how we think about price determination in modern economics. Okay, we'll come back to that at the end of this lecture. Okay, so now we've got relatives, right? But, you know, what determines the specific wage rate or the specific price? Like, you know, why is a widget, you know, 20 units of wage, right? Or 20 units of currency versus another widget is 40 units of currency and so on. You know, what, what gives us the specific values or prices of a commodity? It, that's another important question, right? Because um, that's what we see when we go to the market, right? You pick up a can of soda or whatever, and you, well, that's uh, you know that's exactly one sixty fourth of your textbook or whatever, right? That's not what the store says. The store says that can of soda seventy five cents or something like that, right? So why is it seventy five cents? Well, we now, okay, now we know why it's one sixty-fourth of my textbook, but we don't know why it's seventy-five cents. All right, so let's let's dig into that. <clears throat> okay, so here's the thing, right? Here's another good fundamental rethink. Where do wages come from? Okay, <laughs> you think of like the stork brings wages. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm entertaining myself here. <laughs> okay, so where, where do wages come from, right? Okay, because wages generally are paid ahead of business revenues, right? If, any, if you ever worked in you know management of any sort, or if you've owned your own business, um, you, you know that 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 you know payroll comes comes every other week or every at the latest every fourth week, right? You got to pay your workers. And generally speaking, the things that they've built, they aren't sold yet. Um, they're, you know, sitting in inventory somewhere. If you're lucky, you sold some of them, right? But but only very rarely will you have sold the entire product produced by labor ahead of 
the wage payment coming due. <laughs> okay, right? For sure. Okay, so then where do wages come from? Think about it for a second. Okay, this is the problem Smith has to think about. Where are wages coming from? And you might have said like, well, I don't know. They seem to come from my, you know, if you're a manager at a store somewhere, maybe like the, the owner was like, hey, run down to the bank and, you know, get some money out so we could write paychecks or something like that or deposit this, you know, says, I remember doing that kind of stuff when I was working in retail management. <laughs> um, so maybe those are the answers you come to, or maybe you just never thought about that at all, right? Or you say, oh, well, business has got a lot of money, right? Okay, well, what about day one, week one of the business operation where, you know, oh, they, they're rich, right? Okay, well, that's not really an explanation, right? What you're saying then in either of those cases is that that wages are paid off previous savings, right? For sure. Okay, let's roll with that idea for a minute. By the way, that's not how modern economics explains wages come from but that makes a lot of sense right it makes a lot of sense okay the wages are wages are received out of previous savings somehow whether it be the business owner's savings or the bank savings or you know whomever okay right so let's roll out and, and smith can't just you know if you're writing a book on economics you can't you can't just do that right you can't just say like wages come from the stork or whatever you know you got to come up with a better explanation than that and Smith's explanation, as well as the common classical explanation for this, is that wages are paid out of what's called a wages fund. Okay, wages fund. So you're going to hear wages fund doctrine throughout the term, right? And this is not how modern economics does this. But as I think you'll see when you read through this, it's like, yeah, oh, well, okay, that, that makes a whole lot of sense, right? And again, you can... If I were to go out in the street, I, I could probably sell this idea um, to somebody and be like, yeah, that, that makes sense. I believe that's how it works. Okay, so here's how the wages fund idea works. Business sells stuff in period one, earns revenue. Now, if you're saying like, wait, wait a second here, okay, but, you know, it's chicken and the egg, right? Okay, right, so anyway, just, just roll with it for a second. So business, I know it's like, if you're thinking like this doesn't make, okay, then good, because you're already on the right track because it's wrong, but... This is how they thought of it. And like I said, for sure I could sell this out, out to the public. Um, if I wanted to hop into the Leader Telegram, I could convince a lot of people, well, you're thinking Leader to the newspaper. If I was to hop on, you know, Twitter or something, I could I could convince a lot of people this is how wages are determined, <laughs> for sure, which would be wrong, right? But it's a convincing argument. So business sells stuff in period one and earns revenue, right? Some of this revenue then gets poured back into the business to prepare for period two. All right, the rest of this revenue is available to pay workers in period two. Okay, so the rest of that rest of previous revenues, or you know, you can think of it as business savings, is the wages fund. Right, so that's the fund or the stock of wage or wealth or whatever you want to call capital, or probably monetary capital, financial capital. Those would probably be the best terms for it. That's the stock of kind of financial capital available to pay wages. So in that case, a specific wage payment is a function of a couple things, right? It's a function of total previous revenues. It's also a function of what is the necessary investment or reinvestment in the firm to, to produce goods and services in period two and maintain the capital associated with you know, getting, keeping the business going and so on and so forth. And, it, you know, if you hear of the example, right, you might think of this as like the wages fund is like seed corn, right? So, you know, so how does this work, right? So if I grow corn, I mean, I, I know like the egg people, right, let's watch this and are like, yeah, this guy doesn't know anything about egg. <laughs> I know this is not what works in corn anymore, right? But it used to work this way a long time ago. So you, you grow corn, right, and then you know, you, of course you eat, eat some of the corn, right? You sell some of the corn, but then you keep some of the corn too, right? Uh, and you might silo it or, you know, somehow store it so it's not going to rot, okay? And, and then you're going to use that corn to plant next year, right? And that's going to, you know, that's going to be your next crop of corn, right? It's going to grow from those seeds in the corn that's left over. Well, that is exactly a wages fund idea. And that is exactly where 
these early economists, that's the analogy that they drew from to come up with these ideas. Which happens a lot, right? And it happens to all of us as we see things in a sort of natural world, and then we, you know, we bring that into our explanation of, of how economies or, or whatever we're trying to explain works. Uh, which gets us back to our sort of lecture zero stuff about where, you know, where do ideas come from and how do ideas develop. But anyway, this is the wages fund idea. Okay. And again, wages fund is a very old fashioned y sort of lame term that, you know, as soon as you say that, people's eyes just go bored now, right? But if you start thinking about like a seed corn style idea and you start explaining it this way, you know, now you can really grab people's attention and you know, you, you, you're explaining something, maybe. You, you, I mean, this is it's wrong in modern economics, but again, it's a pretty good explanation, and it's a good example of thinking something through logically. Okay, <clears throat> so, you know, here in this slide, I, I you know, I, I walk through that, right? So, uh, you know, where what the specific wage payment can be. And there's a lot of implications of this, too, by the way. Um, so, for example, if, if you're somehow, like, let's say you're able to force wage payments up above anywhere. Well, then what are you, what are you doing, right? You're, you're, you're using too much of your current crop of corn as seed, right? <laughs> you're not eating enough or selling enough, right? Okay, so if you think of the wages fund as sort of this fixed thing or that wages come from this sort of fixed pile of money somewhere, it has all kinds of implications. Uh, but the most obvious is, is that any alteration to that amount means that some the other segment, right, is getting either too much or too little. Okay. So, for example, questions like unionization and things like that. If you're coming from a wage fund style idea, okay, well, if, if you're able to unionize and wage increase wages, right, then then you're just robbing from somebody else. Okay. And, and you still hear that argument today, right? As if wages come from this sort of fixed pile somewhere. Uh, and therefore, you know, if wages get, get raised, somehow some somebody's getting robbed somewhere. And um, again, that's not how modern economics works or thinks. Um, but that certainly w was how Smith was looking at it, right? Maybe Smith not so much, but certainly Ricardo will get to next, uh, definitely it's the case, and we'll get to Marx, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Uh, this idea that if we, you know, alterations to these things are, you know, you're, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, to use a biblical analogy. Okay. So, you know, moving on then, you know, variations in, in natural prices. Um, our function of the relative time and effort needed to bring the good or service to market. So that's our relative, right? <clears throat> See, I thought I had another slide here somewhere. Okay. Sorry to go back and forth like that. It's a little jarring. Okay. So combining all these all these ideas, right? The the actual amount of the wage payment is a function in Smith, right? It's a function of last year's revenue and be the payment necessary to bring a given good to market. Natural prices in a single factor model are also a function of these same things. Okay, Variations in natural prices as well as relative wages across a set of goods are a function of the relative time and effort needed to bring the given units of labor to market. Okay, So now we have an explanation of the specific wage payment amount wages fund. We have a specific idea about relative wages, time and effort, Okay, to produce a given unit of labor. And then we have a theory of relative prices that's based upon those relative labor costs. Okay, so <clears throat> we've got absolute exchange values and we've got relative, sorry, I'm counting here, my hand. We've got absolute exchange values, we've got relative exchange values. We've also got a theory of um, labor market price discrimination, which is just another market price, right? Okay. So that's where we are. There's a Hot Wheels, right? This is a, I guess, I don't know much about Hot I mean, I had Hot Wheels when I was a little kid, right? But I think that looks like a 67 or 68 Camaro to me. And I guess that's a valuable Hot Wheel. <laughs> so it's like Pokemon cards and Furbies, right? And old scooters, right? That different people value things differently. 
Okay, so again, if I haven't made it clear enough, this is not how modern economics does this, right? So, you know, in Smith, we've, we've got a theory of prices that's all sort of based around time and effort, right? Or a modern economist might use their phrase that you see in every principles textbook, how irksome is labor, right? Oh, well, it sucks to make that thing, so, or I've got to study really hard to make that thing, so it's expensive now, okay? That is a wholly cost of production driven theory of prices. It is a, uh, we might say, a strictly supply side um, theory of relative prices and relative wages. And um, again, that's not how we think about it in modern economics. Let's move on to the, I think this is the last slide in this one, if I recall correctly. Oh, wait, one more, one more. Okay. Here's an old skateboard deck. I, I remember this one fondly. This is a Jeff Grosso model came out in 1985, I believe. I was a seventh grader, so so if you're older than me, this is nostalgic to your childhood. These came out before. This is like 1968 or something like that. I was when you were born then, right? But for me, like this is like cool stuff, right? So old skateboards. <laughs> They're quite expensive too. <laughs> uh, so there's two differences really between modern economics and. Uh, and Smith's classical economics. In modern economics, we collapse the, collapse the idea of value and price together. Right? They're a single concept. Uh, what is it? What is a thing worth? A thing is worth what the market will bear. That is what we say in modern economics. In other words, whatever, whatever market price proceeds from the sale of an item, that's what it's worth. That's what its value is. Subjective valuation. So these sort of more moral concepts of value. Um, so, so right, so that first point one there, right, that supply and demand terms, right, it doesn't matter if, if, you know, you had to get a lot of training, right, to make a thing. And then, uh, and then you, you know, you made the thing, right, and, and so and then you brought it to market. It was really a big pain to bring to market or everything. You know what? No, that's not what, no, the thing does not have a high price, according to modern economics. No, no. There's also demand consideration. So even though you you know you made that thing, um, and it was really hard to make, and you think it's really cool, right? Um, if nobody else thinks that, it has no exchange value. Okay, uh, so that's a, it's a big difference, right? Um, so even though Smith's argument makes a lot of sense, right? Like I said, I'm pretty sure I could sell it to a lot of people. Um, it's it's not how we think about prices today. Uh, the ideas of use value, which we'll come back to, I think, in the next set of slides. That idea of value is captured in the idea of utility in modern economics. And uh, utility is a really interesting concept in microeconomics. Uh, um, I have a lot of things I want to say about utility, but now is not the best time to say them. Well, we'll get, we'll get to them in the next set of slides. Um, but uh, that, that's how we do it. So the classical condos have use value and they have exchange value. Uh, modern economics has you know, sort of value and price in this bin here, and it's a different determination. And then they have utility, right? Okay. So, oh, here I have the second point. Uh, that's, uh, I believe that's Aristotle. If I remember. <laughs> Aristotle had a lot to say about prices too. Um, uh, we'll come back to that in the next of the slides. I think I'll leave it there. I think we're at about probably about at least a half hour at this point. All right. Thanks, everybody. You know, think about this stuff, right? So it's easy. To, I'm sure, you know, you could just go through this video and just kind of, you know, glaze over it. And, you know, here's Kemp rambling on and laughing at his own dumb jokes about something or another. But I encourage you to think really, really carefully about some of the implications of this. You know, so... You might say, what the heck is he talking about now? Okay, well, right? Okay, so let's go back to that specific wage price just for a second, All right? Let's say that, that uh, I, you know, or you or whomever, right, uh, did, got a lot of training. And let, let's say, so you might say, well, you know, well, they, it has to be the right training. Okay, so let's say they, they do the exact training that everybody tells them they should do. So then they go to all the best sources and they're like, 
you know, you got to study this thing and get learned up on it and be, you know, really good at it. That's what you, that's how you're going to succeed, right? And that person does all those things. They work really hard. They get good grades. They listen carefully. They produce high quality work. And, and then when they get all done, it turns out that the subsequent wage payment isn't even enough to keep them alive. Well, you know, modern ec economics has very little to say about that. Too bad, too sad. Um, is that just, right? Is that just? Uh, is that how society should operate, right? Is that how an economy should operate? Um, it's a more significant question, right? If you're coming at this from the perspective of moral philosophy, like Smith is, or Aristotle, or Aquinas, or in any the handful of people pictured in this slideshow, the question of value is a broader, it's a moral question, right? Um, modern economics is not a moral question at all. It's simply an observation. Okay. And there is some, there's a place where the two collide, right? There's a place where the moral becomes sort of the observation, right? A society that isn't able to pay wages sufficient to maintain life will self-destruct. I mean, that's evident, right? You cannot pay wages sufficient to provide food, clothing, and shelter to labor. That society's toast, and that economy's toast in the long run. So there is a point where the two notions collide and you can no longer remain um, apparently value free. And so I'll leave, you, leave it to you there and uh, we'll see you in the next set of slides. Thanks.